she's the most famous woman in the world. As the figurehead of grand ceremonies, meeting world leaders and heads of state, all meeting her subjects. The Queen has a public face that's instantly recognisable to billions. But there's a private side, a side most of us hardly ever see. It is possible to get a closer look at the woman behind the dutiful monarch on parade. And that's when she's indulging her lifelong love of horses. Everyone knows that the Queen loves racing. Before she does anything else in the morning, she will read her copy of the Racing Post. But what most people don't realise is that the Queen has an in-depth fascination for and great knowledge of the creature that is at the centre of this sport. For the Queen, horses are both an escape and an emotional outlet. Far from the demands of royal duty, they reveal a different side. We've been allowed inside that private world for a close-up look at the Queen's horses, the people who look after them, and the pleasure she derives from it all. Oh, you silly fool. Look at him. <laughs> at Balmoral, we meet a rare native pony breed the Queen has helped save from obscurity. The Queen just adores the fact they're so easy and so uncomplicated. All her life, the Queen has enjoyed the company of horses. And it's a love she's passed down to the rest of her family. Horses are everywhere, and ponies were as natural extension to the pram, basically. This is the Queen at her most relaxed. There's a very good magnetic field when the Queen is close to horses and the people that are involved with the horses. Sandringham, the Queen's estate in Norfolk. It's mid-January and three of the Queen's 35 active racehorses are having their morning exercise. It's just a few weeks before their fitness regime ramps up and they'll head to a training yard. Winter is also the season for new life to begin. The Queen's heavily pregnant mares have spent the day in the paddocks and it's time to bring them in. Three generations of my family are amongst those who have trained horses for the Queen. And now I've come to see the crucial first stages of producing a royal racehorse. Horses usually foal at night, safely hidden from the eyes of predators. Such a pretty yard. It is lovely, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. The Queen has around 25 broodmares, and in matching them with the right stallions, she's trying to create an ever-improved racehorse. Faster, fitter, and happier. So this is one of the new additions to the stud. This is Memory. And as a racehorse in training, she was really talented, but a couple of times on the race course, she decided she just didn't fancy it. She had ideas completely of her own. Stalls opened and she just stood there. But it's interesting that the Queen has decided to take a chance with her because she clearly has a lot of ability. She's very well bred. So her offspring could be very good as long as they can sort the mental side out. And she's ready to pop any minute now. I mean, she's heavily in full and she's actually overdue. Yes, all right, I'm sorry. Don't touch my tummy. One of the Queen's stud grooms is Annalise Rees Jensen. God, magic door. Yes, very good. Her job is to make sure every foal has a safe passage into the world. Talk me through the memory, the mare here, yes. and how close she is she's, to foaling. She's overdue. Now, she was due on the 15th of January, so the gestation is 11 months, so hopefully she'll foal very soon. She's holding on a bit because of the weather. We've had quite a cold snap here, so she's, she's not quite ready yet. But she's... Um, what I do is every day I check, make sure that the others come in the right way, and so check underneath her and... All right, sweetheart. And she's starting to bag up, so hopefully. So when you say she's starting to bag up, she, she's get getting she get, she's yeah. getting milk in the yeah. other. Okay, so, but not much yeah. yet. No, but being a first foal, the bag might not be as big as an old experienced mare. So and how sure. many foals have you actually helped bring into the world? Four, four hundred probably. Four hundred? Yes. <laughs> really? Yeah. 
So you are a horse midwife. If there was a call the midwife for, <laughs> for horses, you would be the I'll star. I would be one, yes. <laughs> The Queen funds her equestrian pursuits from her own private purse. She has around 180 horses and ponies of different breeds at stables in Norfolk and Hampshire and at Balmoral, Hampton Court and Windsor. She still goes riding whenever she can. She always looks happy on a horse. She's totally at home with them. I think because she's always ridden since she was knee-high to a grasshopper, you know. According to Margaret Rhodes, the Queen's cousin, her fascination was obvious from the start in her choice of nursery toys. I can remember when I was quite small how the Queen had a stable of ponies that were in the nursery. She organised them very tidily and they were always, you know, I mean, she probably fed them and watered them, I don't know, but they were always very much part of nursery life. And, I mean, they had to be put to bed at the right time and put to the stables and everything, you know. We played horses a very great deal in a field near the house where we could be circus horses or carriage horses or ponies riding, every kind of horse. But we, we galloped, we trotted, we walked, we did all that kind of thing forever, round and round in circles, um, which, which she enjoyed enormously. I found slightly boring. <laughs> The young Princess Elizabeth was given her first pony, called Peggy, as a fourth birthday present from her grandfather, George V. This is rarely seen private royal footage, the six-year-old princess confidently riding Peggy. And it wasn't just ponies. Whenever she was near horses, the princess wanted to reach out and touch them. I think she has a, a wonderful feel for horses. And, and I think from a very early age, she was just completely absorbed by it. And, and, and it happens. It happens to a lot of people. Um, but we're particularly lucky that, that the queen was um, caught by the bug and, and has become so interested and, and so devoted to, to her horses. Based here at Sandringham, Joe Grimwade has been managing the Queen's thoroughbred breeding program for the past 15 years. When it comes to breeding, when you're matching a, a stallion with a mare and you're trying to create the ultimate racehorse, is that luck or is that science? Uh, both. The, the, the process involves uh, an artistic approach and a scientific approach, and there's a massive art to using all the available tools to, to try and find a perfect mate. And then once you've done all of that, then there's a whole element of luck that dictates whether it's going to produce a great racehorse or, or whether a lesser horse, a lot of it's luck. Over the years, the Queen has built a reputation as one of Britain's most successful thoroughbred breeders. My philosophy about racing is simple. I enjoy breeding a horse that is faster than other people's. And to me, that is the gamble from a long way back. I enjoy going racing, but I suppose basically I love horses. And a thoroughbred epitomizes a really good horse to me. I wonder whether it does become even more addictive the more you get involved because of that combination of the intellectual side of things, of right, let's try and make this work, and then the emotional response, here's a horse I love. Yes, and highs and lows. It has to be said, it's often the lows that, that make the highs so special, and the Queen can take each with equal grace. Foaling season is Joe's busiest time. It's hard to predict when a foal will be born. We waited a week at Sandringham with no luck. So we've left some kit with Joe and his team to capture those first moments on camera. You come down, love The next mare to foal was one called Daring Aim. Her trust in Joe allowed him to get some extraordinary footage. It's a fairly gruesome start. It, it is fairly gruesome. You have to bear um, in mind, I don't watch Call the Midwife because I don't like the birth date. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, sit tight. <laughs> um, so the mare's been through the first stage, walking around. I've picked it up as the foal's actually starting to be born. Annalise is established here, it's the right way around. Everything's going tickety-boo. And the mare's um, lying down and, and straining quite hard. 
Are you so, not constantly amazed looking at that? Constantly that, amazed. That that big shape can come through that little hole? It's absolutely staggering. As the fall comes out, though, it doesn't look alive. No, at the moment it's still getting all its nutrition um, from the umbilical cord. There's no need for it to breathe now. It's happily working on the system that's been keeping it going right through pregnancy. Here it comes. Oh, and you can see the foal blinking there. Just now the foal's blinking. starting to move. Oh, my word. I don't know word. if you see it, but um, now the foal is breathing. Okay. And she's looking around the nurse saying, hello. There you are. Beautiful head already. <laughs> and the ears sort of strangely disengaged to start with. Yeah, take a little while for them to perk up. Listen, they're just wickering at each other. Oh. Such a sweet sight. Should we just move forward a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. They are just extraordinary. And that foal's going to stand up, try to... Oh, cross legs, cross legs. It's amazing how quickly the instinct takes over. I must stand up. I exactly. must be prepared yeah. to yeah. flee if needs be if e you're in the wild. Exactly. The lions are coming. <laughs> the boxes have forgiving walls. So if the foal is bouncing off the walls as it stands up for the first time, that takes a lot of the uh, concussion out and really no chance of them hurting themselves. <laughs> the poor old mares, they get treated absolutely awfully by the foals. They'll get, get a hoof in the face on a fairly regular basis. There's going to be a big push in a moment. Yeah. It seems so unlikely, doesn't it? It seems impossible. It really yeah. Does. And go! Oh, clever Brilliant. go. Brilliant. And when she went for it, she was and, it was all in one movement. And, and, and that was very civilised. You could have a fair more. bit more lurching around the box before this actually happens. But um, and, and they're still very wobbly. Yes. Oh, oh. But it's like they're walking on stilts, isn't it? It, it is, very much. On a ship. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> on, not on very rough seas. <laughs> Having had a few drinks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And already you can see this wonderful sort of athletic frame. The shoulder and the hindquarter and, and the great limbs. And So we're dreaming already. You know, we've, we've got the Oakses in mind now. <laughs> it's 2016. And that's the, the wonderful thing about racing, and I think what draws so many people to it, is that dreams, they, they are limitless. They because are, this yeah. filly has as much chance of winning the Oaks as any other filly born yeah. right now this year. Yeah. And a huge element of uncertainty. But we're hoping that because the Queen gets the ratings right and hopefully we get all the rearing right and we get the, 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 the mental training right, we, we're hoping to give ourselves that little bit of advantage later. When the Queen comes to Sandringham, she'll try to see the new foals as soon as possible, to assess them and get to know them. Morning, Matthew. This year's cold temperatures have produced some particularly furry foals. Now, this is a foal that was born just last night, so the Queen's come down to have a first look. The Queen is accompanied by her racing advisor, John Warren, but she's not the sort of breeder who just leaves others to run the business. The pleasure is in these moments, the personal contact, the development of a relationship with another living, albeit hairy, being. Having greeted the newest arrival, the Queen heads for the main stable yard to see the rest of this season's batch of foals. They'll be shown in age order, youngest first, and asked to parade in front of the Queen and our cameras. So the Queen's now being shown the foals that were born here at Sandringham this year. 
And any time one is a bit skittish, and they are nervous at this age, this is their first sort of public parade, mm. Annalise will step in. And bear in mind, she fold most of these, so the foals know her, the mares know her. She just puts a calming hand round them. by every detail she's got the breeding on a piece of paper in front of her she wants to see the foals walk she wants to know how they behave this foal was only born on the 29th of march so not even a month old and he's quite immature still you know he's all legs Good stability is only a first step. <laughs> but it's so interesting, you can start to see bits of their personality come out, those that are naturally more confident, those that are a bit more hesitant, like this one is. The Queen has seen enough generations of the same family to be able to make comparisons in terms of shape, size and attitude. But it's only when these babies start to gallop that anyone will know if they're any good. Sandringham Stud has just opened a brand new yard, complete with a circular horse walker for exercising up to eight mares. We're with the Queen as she sees it for the first time. Lovely yard. This has been such a joy to have this new yard. It's fantastic. And is Real that, cool. are we facing south? south. Yeah. yeah. It's lovely. I must say, it does improve the horse walker by having some blossoms. <laughs> 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 yeah. This mare, called Set to Music, has just been covered. So she'll be foaling in about 11 months' time. British kings and queens have been breeding racehorses for nearly 500 years. They've played a huge part in the creation and development of the thoroughbred, the fastest equine breed on the planet. And the Queen has played a key role. Thank you very much. Was... She knows so much about horses and how they behave and how they react uh, that I think she, she has done more than anybody in the royal family in history to improve things and raise the standard all round. By the time she was 18, Princess Elizabeth was an accomplished rider, often accompanied by her sister Margaret. But the moment that would open a whole new world to her was a visit to see her father's racehorses. I suppose I first became interested in racing during the war, when my father had leased Big Game and Sun Chariot from the National Stud. When my father took me down to Beckhampton to see them working, which I had never seen before, and I was able to pat them in the stable afterwards. I'd never felt the satiny softness of a thoroughbred before. It was a wonderful feeling. She quickly became devoted to racing and in partnership with the Queen Mother, bought a jumper called Monovine. At Hurst Park in 1949, she watched Monovine triumph, the first horse to win in her name. On to the final jump, and with a six-length lead, Monovine heads for the home stretch, while royal excitement rises to fever pitch. newly found thrill in racing would become a healthy counterbalance to the demands of monarchy. In those sort of moments, she can let rip with, with real excitement, you know. You see, I think that early on when she became queen, I think that she had to sacrifice within herself an awful lot of emotions and, and thoughts of the future and everything else. But I think with horses, it's another world, in that it reduces you to just the person in relation to the animal. 
and you're not queen, you're just a human being. Just four days after her coronation in 1953, the young queen had a well-fancied horse running in the derby, a colt bred at Sandringham called Oriel. The nation was gripped. Would this be the icing on the cake for the newly crowned queen? Or would it go to the legendary jockey Sir Gordon Richards riding Pinza, who'd never won the derby in 27 attempts? Oriol takes up the challenge as befits a Queen's champion, overtaking Shikampur and gaining on Pinza. But Pinza won't be denied, nor Gordon Richard, the 49-year-old veteran of the saddle, recently knighted by the Queen. He's won 4,670 races, but never the Derby. And today, his 28th Derby try is crowned with glory. First of his profession to be knighted, Sir Gordon beat the daylights out of his Queen's entry. It was a great day for a knight. I think it was very exciting to have a horse so soon as an owner to run in the Derby. And one couldn't really be sad not to win because Sir Gordon had won his last one won a Derby. The Queen has always been enterprising about the training and treatment of her horses. In the 1950s, she asked a Harley Street neurologist to help calm the overexcitable Oriole the same colt who was second in the 1953 derby. The laying on of hands was very definitely not standard practice at the time, though it did seem to have a soothing effect, and he went on to win major races at Epsom and Ascot. It's amazing how open her mind is, and the fact that when she saw something new, she didn't go back to this traditional feeling of, ooh, because so, the, the racing world can be a bit like that, you know, it can go oh, very no, much that new. way. And it would be safer for her to do that. But she didn't. The Queen's interest seems to me to be not just winning races, but am I giving my horses a better life? Monty Roberts is the man they call the real life horse whisperer. In 1989, the Queen heard about Monty's innovative and instinctive approach to handling horses and invited him to demonstrate at Windsor Castle. This Californian one-time rodeo star used the horse's own body language to win their trust, which flew in the face of more traditional methods of breaking in a horse through fear. The Queen was so impressed, she encouraged Monty to write about his methods. And to this day, she calls on him for help with her most difficult yearlings. So who's this, Rochelle? This is Sharp Lookout, a two-year-old colt bred by the Queen and owned by her as well. And Monty, what are the challenges that he has presented you? Well, Claire, this is the most sensitive yearling I've ever dealt with. He is absolutely incredible. In the early stages, he was just Mount Vesuvius. Any time you went to touch him, everything exploded. So we've had a challenge but things are coming around now really well, and he's had his first rider in this last week. Well, I'd love to see you work on him. Okay. The thoroughbred is a naturally highly strong animal, and the early stages of training are often a challenge. As a foal, Sharp Lookout was so jumpy, he gave himself an eye injury, now on the mend. Let's go. For our benefit, Monty is going to demonstrate the process this difficult horse has gone through to prepare him for a rider. So you can get the personality traits of this horse pretty quickly when you see all of this volatility and that head up and tail up and all this flying around. If a thoroughbred's skittish energy can be properly channeled, anything is possible. But watch as his ear comes to me on this side, and he licks and chews, the adrenaline is falling down. And if the adrenaline gets down far enough, you'll see him lower his head. And when they do, the adrenaline really falls. Having driven Sharp Lookout to flight, Monty now turns his back on him. So let me just step over here and have him look at me with my shoulders away from him and my eyes away from him and just see if I can get him to want to come to me. Monty is mimicking the behavior of a mare, disciplining her foal. Just those little steps are so important 
to get this whole thing started. That's a good boy. Okay. <clears throat> I'll just take that plastic bag there now. And now where? trust is won. The next step is to reduce Sharp Lookout's alarm at random moving objects, like plastic bags. So I want him to take these kind of things and stand here and accept it wherever it goes. Honestly, I'm just dumbfounded. And now this is a crucial moment, getting the horse to accept something on his back. It is incredible, this, because the connection that Monty has with the horse is so strong. And this is a horse who's clearly wanting to do things for him. And it's almost impossible to believe that this was the most difficult, difficult animal on the place, probably one of the most difficult they've ever had. This is one that's just been in... Monty's now introducing the horse to a training dummy that was recently invented by an Irish trainer. I love yeah. the fact that the mannequin's got the... <laughs> He's got the jacket on. He's got the uniform. <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. He's got the Queen's jacket on. Now, this horse would absolutely freak out and just blow completely apart when we first started with the mannequin. So, if the human being got up there, human being is going to come down. And um, when, when the rider comes down, a habitual pattern of behavior gets set up so that the horse finds freedom from that rider. And you've seen horses that are habitually loose on the race courses and get one rider after another down. It's very bad. Now we have our mannequin rider in place. <laughs> it does look very funny, I'm sorry. Yep, but he rides well, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, he does. The next step is to get a real live jockey on the horse. Even a mature racehorse can be quite tricky at this stage, and the leg up is often done on the move. This is only the second time I've schooled him to this standing still. Here we go. <laughs> How many racehorses will do that? I know. <laughs> oh, he's nice. Okay, you can give us a trot around. Adrian, the jockey, quickly has sharp lookout at an impeccable trot. You can give him a little canter now. That is amazing. Good. Very nice. You can stop now. After a few circuits, Sharp Lookout finishes. And a step back. With a neat reverse. Good. Very, very nice. Hey, fella. How about that? <laughs> Honestly, that is like watching a miracle. Yeah. In process, because I know how, you know, they told me how difficult you were. <laughs> you just want to do it now, don't you? So one day, I might get to be talking about you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Running at Royal Ascot or something. Yeah. Yes. Wouldn't that be something? Paul Hampton is the Queen's private yard in Hampshire. This is where stud groom Rochelle Murat teaches last year's batch of foals to be comfortable around humans. Queen has come to see for herself how they're getting on. With the help of John Warren and Rochelle, the Queen takes in the physical development of these young horses and watches them walk. She assesses their natural athleticism and their conformation, how their bodies are put together. Love the shape. Oh, this is such an interesting stage of a racehorse's development because these are yearlings and the Queen hasn't seen most of them since they were foals. So a bit like children who are getting ready to go to big school, they'll go into training next year. They still look overgrown and hairy. Can't really believe that they're racehorses, but they will be. 
All of the yearlings have behaved beautifully, apart from two, who take fright, possibly at me standing at the side of the field, and they start to play up. Ollie and Joe, who are leading them, remain completely calm. I tell you something, it's very, very impressive the way these yearlings are handled, because you can see how skittish they are, how the slightest thing will spook them. But they do so well just to keep a loose rein. And they've calmed down again now. The Queen has seen flighty behaviour like this before and knows just how to deal with it. There's a certain amount of intuition, as you can see. Just so gently and so sensibly and very slow in the movements. Just hello there. how impressive that is. I mean, they're the only two so far that have come in here and behaved really badly. But the Queen's made sure that with both of them, she's gone up to them. Paul Hampton is also home to some older horses whose racing days are over. Now, these are all retired horses. So free agent in front who won the Cheshire at Royal Ascot in 2008. It's something that's particularly notable about the Queen as a breeder. She doesn't lose interest in her horses at the end of their racing careers. She always will do all she can to make sure the horse has a happy retirement. And that's, you know, she always wants to know what's happened to the horse when it's no longer able to race. Um, and it's no longer, it's not perhaps good enough to go to stud, but she'll always try and make sure it has a happy home. However disappointing or moderate it may have been, it has a happy life in retirement. Oh, you silly Look at him. <laughs> so is that for me? Hello. <laughs> All those babies of coats, and then you get the older ones. <laughs> These Paul Hampton pensioners are being used to educate the younger ones. Their own racing careers have been ended by injury or old age. And the idea now is that their mature, calming influence will teach the yearlings not to be frightened of their own shadows. They're nannies, if you like. Oh dear, it's always sad, isn't it, when you've seen things with legs gone. But they look happy. They look happy, man. They all look well. Got a job, haven't they? Yeah, They're... that's the key. Giving them something. They're, they're very useful if you wouldn't use them for leading yearlings. And yeah. Things like some of them are not very, they're a bit spooky sometimes. But... Over the past 60 years, horses bred by the Queen have scooped up many of Britain's best races. One of the most successful results of her meticulously planned breeding programme was a filly called Highclere. Highclere's victory in the 1974 1000 Guineas convinced the Queen to take a trip across the Channel to the French Oaks. Chantilly, Sunday, the 16th of June, 1974, the Pied de Dian. Well, I decided to send Highclere to run in the Pied de Dian instead of the English Oaks after the guineas when it became apparent she was good enough to go to France. But, uh, I'd never been racing in France when I had a horse running. Well, it was a, just a lovely outing for me. The president was, was uh, of course, very kind and, and made it very easy for me to get to Chantilly. Highclere made the trip thoroughly worthwhile with a resounding win. The crowd was tremendously friendly. And even after the race, when I cared one, they seemed even more friendly, lucky. Careful breeding is just one part of the equation. When her horses are old enough, the Queen tries to match each one with a suitable trainer, responsible for getting the best out of them. It's a Sunday morning in the West Country, and the Queen is seeing her horses in the relaxed but focused atmosphere of a racing yard. Today is the Queen's 87th birthday, but instead of having an official function or estate 
dinner. She's here in Wiltshire at Richard Hammond's yard to have a close-up look at five horses she has in training here. Richard Hannan is one of Britain's top trainers. He looks after more than 260 horses for 150 different owners. He's been champion trainer four times and is notoriously plain speaking and free of airs and graces. He thinks owning racehorses should be fun and he makes sure that's the case for everyone, including the Queen. Out on the gallops, the Queen has a chance to see her horses working and to discuss with the trainer what type of race might suit each one. She also takes a keen interest in other good horses in the yard, whoever owns them. That feeling of being behind the scenes, in the know, adds to the pleasure of watching the early morning gallops. Richard, how much does it mean to you to train for the Queen? Oh, I mean, she's a wonderful woman to deal with, you know. She's uh, uh, very easy to train for and uh, she's very knowledgeable, you know, about the whole situation. She doesn't miss very much. <laughs> no. What is the Queen looking for when she comes here to see the horses at this time of year? What, what are you trying to show her? Well, we wanted to see, obviously, all the horses, all the horses working and to see what stage of the game we're at. They're nice horses. You know, they're by invincible spirit. I mean, they're beautifully bred. You've got every chance. Do you have to watch your language at all? Certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> Only when Her Majesty's here. <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah. So this morning? No, everything fine. Nothing went wrong. Shouting and screaming? No, nothing. Everything all right, wasn't it? It all went well. race day at Newbury. This isn't one of the top meetings in the racing calendar, but it's attracted a wide range of people who've come to enjoy a good day out. It just so happens that one of them is the Queen, mingling with the crowd. When she's lucky enough to go racing, she can switch out of all the everyday work and worries into something which is totally different, and I think it's very good for her to be able to do that. John Warren, the Queen's racing advisor, is once again by her side. John, do you think there's an attraction with racing folk that there's huge respect, but it's a very relaxed atmosphere because you have to be calm around horses mm, mm. and you can't be constantly, you know, curtsying or bowing no, and, no. you know, shuffling around. Actually, everybody's got to be on, a, on an equal level. Uh, I feel the Queen is extremely comfortable around animals and that that seems to um, transfer itself. People that work with animals are generally calm as well, and therefore there's a very good magnetic field when the Queen is close to horses and the people that are involved with the horses. So um, she, people feel comfortable around her and vice versa, I yeah, think. Yeah. So, so less fuss in a way. Far less fuss. Yeah. How impressed are you with the Queen's depth of knowledge? Well, she has such a tremendous memory she can remember the bloodlines going back for about five and six generations. And I, I think that has allowed her to have so much knowledge that's accumulated over the years that it's, um, I, I think she would have made a wonderful racehorse trainer. Today, the Queen has a promising contender in the 415. Sign Manual is a four-year-old gelding she bred from the top-class derby-winning stallion Motivator and one of her broodmares, called New Assembly. It's interesting, he looks quite a tricky horse, you know, he's pulling for his head, he's sweating up just a little bit, he's clearly not straightforward. And the attraction for the Queen is to see whether this horse can fulfil his potential, whether actually the breeding of a great stallion motivator with a mare that the Queen knows well is going to produce something that is better than either of them. It'd be quite hard to be better than Motivator. You just see, watch him come round. He just is a little bit difficult. He's seeing everything. He's noticing everything. He looks a bit of a handful. Is he? No? Maybe he just knows it's race day, you know? He says everybody's looking at me. 
In the saddle will be Haley Turner, who rides many horses for Sign Manual's trainer, Michael Bell. She's ridden winners for the Queen before and is rated as one of the most capable jockeys in the country. Do you always feel a bit different if you're coming to the race and think, oh, I'm riding for the Queen? Yeah, I always get a little bit nervous um, just going into the paddock. When I get on the horse and I'm out on the track, I'm fine, but it's just the you know, left leg behind the right and ma'am, not ma'am, or the other way around, isn't it? I'll get it right. It and, is ma'am. Yeah, ma'am, <laughs> yeah. And, um, but yeah, it's, um, it's obviously a huge privilege to, to ride for her, and I think racing's very lucky to have her involved in the sport, definitely. And when you have that conversation in the paddock, what input do you I mean what do you say about the horse to the Queen or is there a discussion about riding tactics yeah um, obviously Michael Bell who trains the horses will be there um, so he'll sort of give me his ideas about what he thinks and um, Her Majesty always always has a keen interest on the horses characters and she knows she knows quite a lot so you have to be really on the ball well good luck yeah thank you cheers it'll be very exciting to see you ride a winner today I think. yeah fingers crossed <laughs> thank you Man -dog. Two miles of the trip, the Pruitt's 1759 handicap, and early on Knox Over Street it is, who sets off with purpose. This is the weirdest race. It's a two-mile race, and there's one horse that's gone absolutely miles clear called Knox Over Street. The Queen's horse is now third last, not travelling that comfortably, I would say. He got very warm behind, beforehand. He was a little bit G'd up when Haley got the leg up in the paddock. But the main bunch have got this amazing distance to make up on the leader. So it's a case of whether that jockey, Daniel Kremen, has got this absolutely right and slipped the rest of the field, or whether he's mucked up and the rest of them could reel him in. Sign Manuel's just travelling a little bit better now, just overtaking a couple of horses. It's a real stamina test and it's a long, long way. But Haley's pushing now. They're catching the leader. Oh, it's quite exciting. Come on, Haley, get through. Go on, Haley. Simon Manuel's moved into fifth. Got a wall of horses in front of him. Now he's switched to the outside. Go on, Haley. Making up ground. Moving into the third. Go on, Haley. Firm to go. Moving into second. Go on, Haley. Catching with every stride. You may think owners get blasé about winning, but every victory is a thrill, especially when the Queen can be there to enjoy it in person. And there's always room for another vase. Not for the first time, Haley takes to the winner's podium with the Queen. <laughs> Away from the race course, the Queen has never lost her childhood love of ponies. In fact, she's been instrumental in helping to boost the profile and the numbers of several native British breeds. At Balmoral, stud manager Sylvia Ormiston breeds Highland ponies for the Queen, and she has an unusual way of rounding them up. I've seen dogs, you know, herding sheep and herding cattle. I've never seen them herd Careful ponies there, before. The dogs are brilliant. They're just fantastic. They bring the ponies. It's great for the ponies to respect the dogs too. And these are all homebred here on the yes. stud, bred specifically to carry deer yep. off the side of the hill or to carry, you know, big panniers either side of them. Yes. Really good example here at the thickness of the coat. If I take my glove off, girl, you sort of you get right in there. I mean, that is a really, really warm, thick coat, isn't it? Good girl. What's the attraction for the Queen? What does she like about Highland ponies? 
I think, uh, who wouldn't like them? Really, honestly, who wouldn't like them? I think the Queen just adores the fact they're so easy and so uncomplicated to do what they have to do here. It suits the Balmoral lifestyle, it suits the Highlands of Scotland lifestyle. This is what they do. When you go out the hill with a pony and be part of that team, you and it doing its job and working as one together, it's extremely rewarding. Highland ponies have been used in this region for centuries. Ever since Queen Victoria bought Balmoral in 1852, the estate has kept an unbroken line of these hardy little animals. The Queen has continued to champion them and other breeds. Today, when the Queen's out riding, it's on a fell pony called Emma. Her stud groom, Terry Pendry, is alongside her on a Highland pony bred at Balmoral. Good girl. Stand, Stand. Just have a look at, at this, how different this is from a thoroughbred. Little ears. Small ears, yeah. Why? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Reduce heat loss in the wintertime. Plenty of hair keeping. Big, thick neck. And keeping big, everything yeah. cosy and warm. So and the mane acts as a sort of protective shield, does it? Absolutely. Now this is really distinctive, isn't it? And only certain breeds of pony have this. The big stripe going down the back. Yes. What's that called? That's the eel stripe. Most Highland ponies have it. Most colours have it, but not all colours have it. Um, and a lot of the grey ponies will actually lose it as they get older. Well, sort of prehistoric. Absolutely. You know. So how much weight can she carry? Well, this size of pony would happily carry a 16 stone stag. Um, you know, it's a big weight, but they do it over a long period of time rather than over speed. Obviously, your thoroughbreds do the, 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 the speed for, for short bursts. This pony will do that all day. She seems very calm and laid back and, you know. It's essential for the breed, absolutely yeah. essential. To be able to do what we do, they've got to be calm. Oh, come around here and girl. just look at her bum. Now that, <laughs> good girl. That is a good looking backside, isn't it? Built for strength. <laughs> She's just such a little, you know, ball of muscle, aren't you? And a bit of fat to keep you warm. Definitely. It's perhaps no surprise that the Queen's dedication to horses has rubbed off on those around her. Whether it's carriage driving, playing polo, or three-day eventing, horses have always been an important unifying bond for the royal family. How much of an effect do you think horses have had through, through your life and th through the Queen's life as well and that shared interest? I mean, I think because we grew up, um, you know, the horses are everywhere and ponies were as a natural extension to the pram, basically. Um, it, it, it never seemed that we were introduced. They were always there. That's what you did. Like their mother, the royal children grew up essentially children of the countryside. For Prince Charles and Princess Anne, the enjoyment of riding was taken into separate competitive spheres. My brother and I had different ways of riding and he went off down the polo um, scene slightly more seriously. And I was distracted into the eventing world. So you go off in your own different directions, but it's still a very common bond in terms of um, the, the fact they were always there. And that's a great, a great thing for a family to have. By the time she was 21, Princess Anne had already won gold at the European Eventing Championships. Five years and two silver medals later, she'd be heading for the Olympic Games. Talking of the Olympics, when you were young, was that an ambition that you had or something no. that just... And oddly enough, as a youngster, it was never an ambition I had. Really? No, I just didn't think like that. And I suppose when I first started, of course, I'd spent most of my young life watching polo. Don't forget, I thought I was going to be a polo player. So it had nothing to do with eventing, that came much later. Don't, Don't do buy the high face. No, that would be a bad idea. Faces are cool. That's definitely not. <laughs> Montreal, 1976. Princess Anne became the first member of the royal family to represent Great Britain at the Olympic Games. On the cross-country course, at the 19th fence, the princess took a dramatic fall. 
It was a sobering reminder that when it comes to horses, skill is no guarantee that things won't go wrong. No idea what happened. Till about half an hour after I finished. And then uh, I was having a conversation in the stables. And at the time, I thought it was, it, it, I'm sure other people have had concussion have had this, but I appeared to be sitting up there somewhere, listening to myself having a conversation in the dark. And then I suddenly reappeared in the stables thinking, where have I been? But I suspect concussion is like that for lots of people, you know. Do you think having competed yourself and being aware of the dangers as you are, does that make you better at watching Zara do it? Or, or can it be, you know, a case of knowing too much? Well, I think in, in my case, and this is, I would put down to both parents, was their ability to say, all right, you carry on and just get on with it. And nobody ever said anything about, are you sure this is the right thing to do? They grew up watching me. They trusted me and, and my judgment, and, and it was a learning experience. And if I was good enough and, and got it right, that was, that was absolutely fine. So it would be extremely cheeky of me to turn around and say, <laughs> No. Following in her mother's footsteps, Zara Phillips has won several medals in three-day eventing, including gold at both the European and World Championships. What's the attraction for you and indeed for your mother and, and for the Queen of being around horses? I don't know. I think it's... It is a passion. They're very special animals and I think it's a connection, isn't it? And you get friendships from them and, you know, they're characters as well. And, um, and, you know, they, you don't have to get abused back, do you? <laughs> it's definitely a love that's been passed down anyway, that's for sure. Toy Town, the horse that put Zara on the eventing map, is now retired. But he's a treasured friend and still lives at her yard. Toy Town, four of us bought right at the beginning. My mum, my dad, um, me and my grandmother. So we all had um, shares in him. And then I've probably ridden four of her horses that she's bred. But this is him, this is Toy Town, the horse that gave you so many great moments. I know. You get all emotional inside when you start thinking about it. He's been a legend and I can't thank him enough. <laughs> he loves it though. He's just, you know, you get those horses that just love being out, love performing. And he's one of those. He's a bit of a show off. <laughs> More than once, Zara has received medals from her mother, including Team Silver at the London 2012 Olympics. And straight after every competition, she's been on the phone to the Queen. The first person I've always spoken to is my grandmother. <laughs> she's been watching on the TV. And is that the one person you want to share it with as well? Yeah, because I think, as far as I'm concerned, the interest came from my grandmother and because of her love and passion for horses, we've all grown up, you know, sitting on a horse. She's so supportive in a way that she can never be there, but she totally understands as well, you know. She's always massively proud, so... It's always um, good in making your grandmother proud anyway. <laughs> That's what we try. During the course of her reign, the Queen has bred the winners of over 1,600 races, including most of the sport's prestigious prizes. But there is a holy grail that remains elusive. The Queen has, uh, has bred and owned the winners of every classic race except the Derby, and some of them several, t you know, more than once. But, you know, that's, that's the one really important race which has eluded us so far. As recently as 2011, it seemed the Queen had a real chance in the Derby with an impressive colt called Carlton House, originally a gift from the ruler of Dubai, Sheikh Mohammed. The papers were full of hopeful stories. On the day, the Queen's family turned out in force to show their support. And he came there with a burst of speed that looked for a stride or two as if it might be decisive. In a close finish, Carlton House was third. For the Queen, the Derby remains the unfulfilled dream. But the thrill of racing is only one part of her love for horses 
of every shape and size. Every year, the Queen hosts one of Britain's most famous horse events in what is effectively her back garden. The Royal Windsor Horse Show is a celebration of all things equestrian, from pony club games to exotic breeds to glittering displays by the Queen's household cavalry. The thing about the horse world is it's not always glamorous. You've got to muck in, you've got to come out whatever the weather. And the Queen has come today to the Royal Windsor Horse Show to watch fell ponies and highland ponies that she's bred being judged. The Queen has two fell ponies in the first event, bred at her Hampton Court stables. The judges are looking for the best confirmation, the shape, the size, the gait, ultimately promoting a healthier, better breed. And you can see the real knowledge, the pride, as these ponies go around the show ring. Just one of hundreds of people trying to win a prize, trying to judge her breed against others to find if these are better than anybody else's. In this class, the Queen manages only fifth place, but the next event is the one to watch out for. Sylvia Ormiston has come down from Balmoral to watch a very promising homebred Highland pony, a two-year-old filly called Balmoral Harmony. of Cornwall has arrived to join the Queen. They're watching the judging for the Highland ponies. And this would be a massive boost to Sylvia and the team at Balmoral if she's successful in front of the eyes of the judge. The first two places go to other breeders. In third place, it goes to number 503, Balmoral Harmony, owned by Her Majesty the Queen. But a respectable third isn't bad. Yeah. Well done. So how's third place? Is that all right? Oh, delighted. Absolutely delighted. She's a two-year-old filly, shown in a rope. Halter, as a two-year-old filly, should be shown. And uh, top place filly, because she was only beaten by two colts. So very, very pleased. Strong class. And good job, Lizzie. Well yeah. done. Yeah, Lizzie, you did the leading up there. Yes. And she behaved pretty well, didn't she? A few of them didn't, yeah, but she, she did. Yeah, she has got the most incredible temperament, and she's so easy to work with, because no matter how beautiful they are, they have got to have the temperament to show, and she's fabulous. <laughs> You're a superstar, Harmony. Yeah, well done. Very good, very good girl. Very pleased with her. From the first contact with a newborn foal, to the calm, gentle bonding with yearlings, to the uncertainties and thrills of the race course. The horse world has shown us a more intimate side to the Queen. It's been so interesting watching the Queen up close with horses, and you can really appreciate her understanding of them, her connection with them as well. And I think that horses reflect the best in human nature. If you're kind with them, if you're consistent, if you're disciplined, and if you show affection, they will show it back to you. You can't always win with horses. The Queen knows that. And in some ways, that's not the point, because this animal, whether it be thoroughbred or highland pony, this is her passion. The Queen's coronation was the first such occasion to be shown on television. David Dimbleby recalls that momentous day in a special programme at nine next Monday here on BBC One.